if you want to boil it down to one thing, there is one thing that Jesus requires of those who belong to him by faith, and that's be faithful. He says it over and over in Scripture. Be faithful to his word, be faithful to him, be faithful to his promises. He is faithful to his promises to us. And that's what we've gathered together this morning to celebrate, the faithfulness of our God to us. And in response, our faithfulness to him. And this morning, we have this tremendous opportunity to witness, to hear, to rejoice with three young people who are going to promise faithfulness to their Savior for the rest of their life. That is a tremendous thing. There is no more important promise in all of life because this is the only promise that will extend beyond this one. And it's my prayer that God blesses them richly as they make that promise and God blesses you richly as you rededicate yourself to your Savior, faithfulness to him. A good morning and a welcome to all of you. If you're using the hymnal for today's order of worship, it begins on page 38. We join now in the opening hymn number 599. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, a 
according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, be gracious and come with your many gifts. Grant us especially the gift of faith, that we may with all boldness and confidence declare Jesus to be our risen Savior and King. We pray in his name, who lives and rules with you and the Father as one God, now and Please be seated. For this Confirmation Sunday, our first lesson is from the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua is now the leader of the children of Israel, and he speaks to them and urges them to remain faithful to the Lord. The people respond by rededicating themselves to the true God, who has promised them their salvation. Joshua said, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who's lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. Here ends the first lesson. Today's psalm is 119C. We'll listen as the artist plays an introduction and then join us.
now today's second lesson from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Paul urges us to be strong in the Lord and to put on the armor of his word. Our Lord and his word will protect us from the attacks of Satan, which are aimed at robbing us of saving faith in Jesus. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Here ends the second lesson. Alleluia, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Alleluia. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 4. Jesus teaches us the parable of the sower. As we make and renew our vows to remain faithful to the Lord and his word, may we also bring forth a good crop of the fruits of faith. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. This is the gospel of our Lord.
so it's hard to believe, but it was about 34 months ago that I first started meeting with these three young people. That's a long time when you think about it. And although we didn't meet through the summers, we met through the school years, and we studied the Word of God in a systematic way, the truths of the Christian faith. And you might say, well, Pastor, that's enough for me. You, you know, you've, you've, you've studied the Word of God with them. You've taught them. That's good. So why this public examination? Well, for two reasons. Number one, one of the things you called me to do was to teach God's Word to our children. And that's a very important thing. And you need the assurance that that is being done in our congregation. That has been done with these three young people. It's good for you to hear that. But it's also good for them to confess their faith, to say, this is what I believe. I hope this is not the first time, and I pray this is not the first time that they tell somebody else, this is what I believe about the Christian faith. It's just the beginning. And this gives them an opportunity to do that. So listen intently as these confirmands share with you what they believe and know from the Word of God. Kay, how do we know there is a God? We know there is a God from creation, our conscience, and the Bible. Alex, who is the true God? The true God is the triune God. Tom, what do we mean by triune? We mean three persons but one God. Who are the three persons of God, Kay? The three persons of God are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Alex, when did you become a child of God? I became a child of God at my baptism. Thomas, what blessings did your baptism work in you? Your baptism worked the blessing of forg forgiveness of sins, life as a child of God, delivers from death and, and the devil, and eternal salvation. Those are tremendous blessings. Kay, what gives baptism such great power? God's word and faith gives baptism such power. Alex, who should be baptized? All people are to be baptized, including infants. Well, Tom, why do infants need to be baptized? Infants need to be baptized because they were born into sin and need to be born again. Okay, what type of sin is that called? It is called inherited sin. Alex, from whom did you inherit sin? I inherited sin from my parents. The fact that you inherited sin, so did I, shows itself in which other type of sin, Alex? I'm sorry, Tom? It shows itself in actual sin. Actual sins are the breaking of God's law. Kay, what does the law show us? The law shows us our sin and our need for a savior. Alex, give me a, uh, what is the summary of God's law? The summary of God's law is to show love toward God and love toward your neighbor. Tom, give me the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not despise his preaching or his word, but regard us holy and gladly hear and learn it. Okay, give me the fifth commandment. You shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need. Alex, give me the seventh commandment. You shall not steal. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not take our neighbor's money or property or get it by dishonest dealing, but help him to improve and protect his property and means of income. Tom, what purposes does God's law serve? God's law serves as a mirror, curve, and guide. And Kay, where is the law written? The law is written in, our, in the Bible and in our hearts. Okay, the law is written in, our, in the Bible and in our hearts. She talked about the Bible. Let's, talk, uh, let's speak about that for a minute. Alex, whose word is the Bible? The Bible is God's word. But men wrote it. Tom, how can it be the word, uh, God's word? The Holy Spirit breathed into the writers on what they were to write. Okay. What do we call this important teaching, Kay? Mm, the teaching is called verbal inspiration. So we talked about the law, the one great teaching of the Bible. Alex, which is the other great teaching of the Bible? The other great teaching of the Bible is the gospel. So the Bible contains these two great teachings, law and gospel. Tom, what does the word gospel mean? The word gospel means the good news. Okay, good news about whom? Good news about Jesus Christ. Okay. Alex, what does the gospel teach us? The gospel teaches us about our Savior from sin and what God's gift of eternal life. Tom, we said that the law was written in our hearts and in the Bible. Where is the gospel written, Tom? The gospel is only written in the Word. Okay. What summary of the gospel do we have, Kay? We have the Apostles' Creed. Alex, the first article of the Apostles' Creed speaks about whom? The first article of the Apostles' Creed speaks about God the Father. And Tom, what is his work called? His work is called Creation and Preservation. Okay. How did God create all things, Kay? God created all things in six days out of nothing using his almighty word. How does God preserve you, Alex? God preserves me by providing me all my needs richly and daily. 
And Tom, how does God protect you? God protects me by keeping all evil away or making it serve my good. Because your father has created you, preserves you, and protects you, what should be your response, Kay? My response should be to thank, praise, serve, and obey him perfectly. He demands perfection to obey him perfectly, but we don't. Alex, therefore, what did God promise to send? God promised to send a Savior. Tom, who is that Savior? That Savior is Jesus Christ. Kay, who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is true God, second person of the tr Trinity, and also true man. True God and true man. Alex, therefore, which are the two natures of Christ? The two natures of Christ are his divine nature and his human nature. Okay. Tom, why did your Savior have to be true man? Our Savior had to be true man so he could live under the law and die as our substitute. Okay. Why did your Savior have to be true God? He had to be true God in order to obey the law perfectly for everyone and to die as a ransom for everyone. We call that the per person of Christ, true God and true man. Then we studied his office. Alex, which is the office of Christ? The office of Christ is threefold prophet, high priest, and king. And then we studied his work. Tom, what is the work of Christ called? His work is called redemption. Okay, what did Jesus use to redeem you? He used his holy, precious blood and innocent sufferings and death. Alex, in which state or period of his life did Jesus do his work? Jesus did his work in a state of humiliation. Tom, when did that state begin and when did it end? That state began at his conception and birth and will end at his death and burial. Okay. Okay, how did Jesus make his work of redemption certain for you? He made his work of redemption certain in his state of exaltation. All right, a state of exaltation. Alex, when did that state begin and how long will it last? A state began when he rose on Easter and it will last forever. Tom, how did the blessings of Jesus' work become yours? I must have faith for the blessings to become mine. All right, you need faith. Okay, how did you get your faith in Jesus? My faith was worked in me by the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit next. Alex, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is true God and the third person of the Trinity. And Tom, what is his work called? His work is called sanctification. Okay, what does the word sanctify mean? The word sanctify means to make holy. And t Alex, what does the Holy Spirit use to do his work? The Holy Spirit uses the means of grace. Tom, what are means of grace? The means of grace are the tools or instrument the Holy Spirit uses to give, offer, and seal the gifts of the Father's love towards sinner, such as forgiveness of sins, life as a child of God, and eternal salvation, which Christ has won for us. All right, he uses those means to bring these great gifts to us. Okay, which are the means of grace? The means of grace are the word and the sacraments. Alex, what does the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification include? The Holy Spirit's work of sanctification includes everything he does for a person from the moment he brings him into faith with Jesus until he brings him into heaven. Tom, what four things does the Holy Spirit do for you? The Holy Spirit calls me by the gospel, enlightens me with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in the true faith. Why does the Holy Spirit have to keep you in your faith, Kay? He has to keep me in the faith because the devil, the world, and my sinful flesh try to rob me of my faith. Okay. In the third article of the Apostles' Creed, we confess our faith in the Holy Spirit. But then we go on and we say, I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Alex, what is the church? The church is the gathering of all believers in Christ. Tom, why is the church holy? The church is holy because the Holy Spirit has done its work of sanctification in all of its members. Okay, why is the church Christian? The church is Christian because all its members believe in Christ and it was founded by and upon Christ. T Alex, why is the church invisible? The church is invisible because faith makes one a member, and faith is seen only by God. Even though the church is invisible, Tom, where is the church? The church is everywhere where the word is preached and the sacraments are administered. In the third article, we go on to confess our faith in the forgiveness of sins. Kay, how does God the Father forgive all your sins? He forgives my sins by justifying me. Alex, what is the greatest truth of Christianity? The greatest truth of Christianity is I am justified, my sins are forgiven by God the Father's grace for the sake of Jesus through faith worked by the Holy Spirit. Tom, we said that the Holy Christian Church is invisible. Which other kind of church is there? The other type of church is the visible Christian church. Okay. And Kay, which two kinds of visible Christian churches are there? And the two kinds is a visible, an orthodox Christian church, and a heterodox church. Okay. What special power and right did Jesus give to the church, Alex? The special right and power Jesus gave to the church was to forgive the sins of sinners or to refuse forgiveness. Okay. We call those the keys. 
How does Jesus want the church, Thomas, to use the binding key? Jesus wants the church to use the binding key to refuse forgiveness of sins to impenitent sinners. Okay, how does Jesus want the church to use the loosing key? He wants the church to use the loosing key to forgive the sins of penitent sinners. As you mentioned, the Holy Spirit not only uses God's word to do his work, he also uses the sacraments. Alex, what are sacraments? Sacraments are sacred acts instituted by Christ, having earthly elements connected with God's word, which give, offer, and seal the gifts of the, the Father's love towards sinners, such as forgiveness of sins, life as a child of God, and eternal salvation, which Christ has won for us. When we began the examination, we talked about your baptism, one of the sacraments. Once you've been confirmed today, you'll be welcomed and encouraged to attend the sacrament of the Lord's Supper often. Let's talk about that. Tom, which are the earthly elements in the Lord's Supper? The earthly elements are the bread and wine. Okay, which are the heavenly elements? The heavenly elements are Christ's true body and Christ's true blood. Alex, what do we call the Bible's teaching about the Lord's Supper? We call the Bible's teaching of the Lord's Supper the doctrine of real presence. Real presence. Tom, what gives the Lord's Supper its power? What gives the Lord's Supper its power is the words given and poured out to you for, for the forgiveness of sins and faith which trusts these words. Okay, which are the blessings of the Lord's Supper? The blessings are that forgiveness of sins is sealed, life in Christ is strengthened, and eternal life is assured. Alex, how can you be properly prepared to receive the Lord's Supper? I can be properly prepared to receive the Lord's Supper by having faith in the words given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Tom, what does the Bible tell us to do before coming to the Lord's Supper to see if we have such a believing heart? The Bible tells us to examine ourselves. We practice closed communion. Kay, who shouldn't come to the Lord's Supper with us? Known unbelievers and those who do not share faith should not come to the Lord's Supper. One of the blessings, as you mentioned, of Holy Communion is eternal salvation. Alex, when will you enter eternal life? I will enter eternal life when I die or on the last day. Tom, what happens to the soul at death? The soul is separated from the body. Okay, when will the soul be reunited with the body? The soul will be reunited with the body on Judgment Day. Alex, what will happen to the souls and bodies of unbelievers? The souls and bodies of unbelievers will enter the eternal punishment of hell. What kind of bodies, Tom, will the believers receive? The believers will receive glorified bodies, like Christ's glorified body. And Kay, then what will happen to the souls and bodies of believers? The souls and bodies of believers will enter eternal life, life in, with Christ. This concludes our examination. You can put the mics down. So I just wanted to share a short message with you this morning. Uh, first lesson was quite an astounding day in the history of God's people. They had spent time wandering in the wilderness. They were now in the promised land. Moses was dead. Joshua had replaced him. And Joshua places before them an opportunity. You've been with the Lord all these years, all these decades. If you want to go back and serve those other gods that your forefathers served, go ahead. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And the people answered, we will serve the Lord. It was a tremendous day, a tremendous choice in their life. Unfortunately, it didn't last. If you read on after the book of Joshua, you see how quickly things deteriorated. That's because the people did not keep their commitment to the Lord. More than a decade ago, God chose these three young people to be his own through the sacrament of holy baptism, just as he chose us to be his own and brought us to faith in Jesus. But that doesn't end it. These people here today are not going to make a choice for the Lord today once and be done with it. It's a choice that we all make day after day after day. And one of the things that's been so hard the last three, four, five months is the choices that we have to make every day about how we're going to live our lives and do so safely and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes it changes and we're tired of making these choices. We just want things to be normal. And that can easily be our spiritual point of view as well. We just let it slide. Our God is asking us, no, I want you to rededicate yourself to me now. Here's an opportunity, as I mentioned in my greeting, this is the most important thing ever. When all is said and done, only one thing is going to matter, which is what these three young people are going to speak here in a few minutes, their relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. When everything's said and done, that's it. And that's everything he wants for us too. Lord, I know it's hard. He knows it's hard. That's why he suffered and died for us. He knows we don't make the right choices. And he comes to us, he says, I forgive you. I want you to be mine forever. I'm dedicating myself to you for eternity. 
And we have an opportunity today, along with these three young people, to say, yes, Lord, far be it from us, we too will serve the Lord, and God blesses that. Maybe not always in the way that we want to, but he blesses us eternally. You heard about them earlier, the forgiveness of sins, life with him now and forever, eternal salvation. All the money in the world can't buy those gifts. You can't work all your life for those gifts. God gives them to us by faith in Jesus Christ. What an opportunity. How joyful I am, how joyful you are to hear these three young people say, yep, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. This is my God. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to stay true to him. I'm going to be faithful to him. May God give you that same resolve. And then bless that richly, eternally, by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and speak the Apostles' Creed. some time to render a gift to glorify your name, love to reflect your splendor. This world must know what I have learned, that you bestow what none has earned, the joy of full forgiveness. Amen. Please stand for prayer. I invite you to join with me in the responsive prayer for youth of the church. Heavenly Father, you have gathered people of all ages into the communion of saints. Today we thank you especially for the gift of young people to your church. We come before you today and ask that you keep them in your care. Protect them from the perils and temptations common to youth. Help them resist the pressure to engage in godless and immoral activity. When they become confused, show them the way. When they hurt, Bind up their wounds. When they fail, restore them according to your mercy and keep the cross of Christ before their eyes. Bless them with good friends, competent teachers, faithful ministers, caring parents, supportive homes, and life enriching experiences. According to your wisdom, spare them from the perils of unexpected tragedy, severe illness, violent crime or an untimely death. We implore you to keep them in your loving care. Be with our children as they continue to mature. Teach them to value the value of honest labor and faithful stewardship. Guide and direct them as they prepare for their life's vocations.
Heavenly Father, bless all earthly fathers as they seek to fulfill their calling you've entrusted to them. Give them loving hearts and sound judgment to exercise godly family leadership. May they daily take to heart your admonition not to discourage or embitter their children by treating them harshly or unfairly. Help them instead to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. In loving Christian fathers, may children see reflections of you, the fathers whose love for us is perfect and complete. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Most of all, dear Lord, we ask you to keep this and every generation faithful to your truth. Strengthen believers through the regular use of word and sacrament. Open We'll now observe the rite of confirmation. Congregation may be seated. Confirmands, please step forward. Dear friends in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his dear child. You now have the privilege of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul writing to the Romans said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge that in baptism God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And they see it at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit of the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? I do. Do you believe the teaching that of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? I do, and I ask God to help me. 
Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word? To be faithful in the use of word and sacrament and in faith and action remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as long as you live? I do, I ask God to help me. Since it is God alone who enables us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, it's right for us, dear friends in Christ, to call on him for these confirmands, that he would graciously complete the good work of faith which he has begun in them. Let us therefore bow our heads and pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these confirmands to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in giving them both hearts to believe and mouths to confess his saving name. Enable them to bring forth the fruits of faith and to continue steadfast and victorious until the day comes when all who have fought the good, good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what we as a congregation have asked our Heavenly Father to confer on all of you, we now ask him to give each of you individually. K. Elaine Erdman. May God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you his Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, of grace and prayer, of power and strength, of sanctification and the fear of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Psalm 23, verse 1. Alexander Lane Massey. May the Father in heaven for Jesus' sake renew and increase in you the gift of the Holy Spirit to the strengthening of your faith, to your growth in grace, to your patience in suffering, and to the blessed hope of eternal life. Surely I'm with you always, to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, verse 20. Thomas Henry Ranker. May God, who began a good work in you, bring it to completion at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. Your church now invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Regard your communing at the Lord's table as a privilege given to you by God through his church. Receive this sacrament thankfully and often. The Almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you. You may return to your pew. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 462.
please stand for prayer and the benediction. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Good morning and a welcome to all of you. It's been a special day. Uh, these young people and their families have waited and waited and waited for this day to arrive. And I thank them for their cooperation in making this happen. Uh, for, the, for the young people here, the teens who have done the study, done the work, and were so willing to be here and present and share with you what they believe on the basis of God's word. So thank you for being here this morning. It's my prayer that God richly blesses you as you go about serving him in the week ahead. Just a couple of announcements. We do have cupcakes, not a cake, but a cupcakes, confirmation cupcakes in the fellowship hall. There are also bottles of water. Uh, you, you are welcomed if you feel comfortable doing so. Have one of those cupcakes and a bottle of water. We'd ask that you perhaps head outside with this, even though it's quite warm. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to, to greet the uh, and, and congratulate the confirmands. I ask you to remain uh, keeping safe social distancing with them. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to, to uh, conduct that work with them this day of confirmation. As you are ushered out, please follow the direction of the usher. You use the side aisles, and the usher will start with the back of the church and go to the front. Please make your way through the narthex as quickly as you can so that it can be cleared for the next row of uh, worshipers. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Confirmands, follow me.